Welcome to Making Conversations, a podcast from makers Gemma Millen and Robin Galway. Today we are making conversations with silversmith Stuart Cairns. Hi everyone and welcome to our next episode. This is the second of the second series and we, Robin Galway and Gemma Mellon, are joined with silversmith, jeweller, illustrator, former athlete Stuart Kearns. So thank you very much for joining us. Well thanks for giving me a shout and and asking me to be part of this. It's uh, kind of nice to have a chat again. So for full disclosure, we actually recorded Stuart in our first series, but we had a few technical issues, which meant that the audio didn't work well enough to um, do it justice. So we are recording again. So I hope that it sounds pretty consistent and there's no in-jokes or anything that people won't understand. But if we can start from the start, Stuart, could you tell us a bit about your early education, how you got into jewellery and silversmithing and yeah, a bit about your childhood and how you managed to come into it in the first place. Okay, <laughs> and you've got two hours, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, I'll try and keep it brief. Probably growing up, I would like making things and, and I, n- I never really saw myself as creative. My family isn't creative, but I was always kind of a bit of a daydreamer and stuff. And I always like messing about on, you know, in the woods or down by the sea and, and just collecting things and making things and always interested in other people that made things or painted or, you know, but I didn't really click any of that thing, you know, any in any great way. So um, schooling, I loved art, my favourite subject, but I never really felt like I was particularly good at it. But I always kept kept it up and kept it up right to A level. And then university, I didn't go to art college straight away. I mean, I didn't, I didn't really see myself as an, as an artist at the time. I didn't think I was particularly creative or anything like that. So um, my family would have would be more kind of thinking I should go into business and stuff. So I didn't, went and did an economics degree. The funny thing was when I was doing the <laughs> economics degree was all my friends because I was still painting and making things. I've just been joined by my cat. Um, <laughs> They were saying, oh, you should, you know, you should do some art. You should, you're, you're an artist. And I was like, no, I'm not. Uh, but I just carried on doing things, painting things and stuff. And then when I came back to Northern Ireland, I was doing a gardening job. I started making stuff again. And I happened to take, you know, mention my boss one time, just a lunch break. We were stopping for lunch. And I said, oh, I was thinking about taking like a half day to do some, to make things. I'm starting to sell them in a shop. Oh, he said, oh, you want to be, you know, you want to do art. You want to be an artist. You should talk to my mate, Gavin. So... We go in and he phones this guy, turns around to me and goes, oh, you've got an interview next week. And I was like, interview? What interview? And he said, well, it's for a foundation course. So um, so I went along, grabbed up some drawings, went along and chatted to, it was Gavin Weston. He's an artist, he's, he, he writes now mostly, but he was, at the time, he was doing a lot of visual arts, sculpture work, that sort of thing. Gavin had a look at what I did and it was sort of like some illustrations, some drawings, a few things I'd made in air dry clay, that sort of thing. He said, well, look, you need to do a bit more than this. Do some, Go and do some life drawing and then come back and see us in two weeks and we'll give you a proper interview. So I did that and got into foundation. And then first week of foundation was just like, you know, couldn't believe it. You know, really just overjoyed at being surrounded by art. And, and the idea of doing art all the time was just amazing. And the essays were about art and not macroeconomic policy. How good was that? So, um, so yeah, really... It was a funny thing, just, you know, that, that first week and that first day of looking around. Um, and it was just in this big old school hall, just realising, you know, I was where I was supposed to be. So that's how I started off. And then it was just, I was just supposed to do the one year thing because I didn't really understand what a foundation course was. And I was actually doing, the work I'd been doing before was air dry clay. So I thought I would do ceramics, but then I found I just didn't really like ceramics. And uh, I was doing all this mixed media stuff and they got me exposed to people like Andy Goldsworthy and um, Andy Gormley. I got uh, given Derek Jarman's Garden, which was very influential for me as well. So, um, and then the conversations you're having with other, you know, other people on the course. I think I went in there with a very limited idea of what art was, and it just completely blew the walls off, you know, and. And then they were the ones that said, you know, when I was thinking about applying for, for courses, I really didn't know what to do. I didn't know whether to do 
sculpture because I liked making things, but I didn't really think sculpture then was very, very conceptual. And I wasn't really thinking about these big concepts and stuff. And they suggested, well, you like the scale you like making and you're like interested in materials. So the jewelry course in University of Ulster, you can it's, it's really open. You, you can use whatever materials you want. So I tried to get in there and got a place and then, you know, went from there. I didn't go in with any big understanding of what jewelry was, what silversmithing was. I just like materials and then um, so when I got there then I started looking at jewellery and, and silversmithing and trying to find meaning in those object types. Jewellery was a bit trickier. I got jewellery first and I didn't really connect with it at the time but then Cara came in, uh, Cara Murphy uh, and started doing silversmithing and then there was something about those shapes and those forms that I really liked so I sort of thought well that's that's maybe what I am. Maybe I'm a silversmith. So, so that's how I got into it. All those little steps, foundation just completely changed everything and introduced me to a lot of things that shaped how I work now. There was like even drawings, like seeing the work of printer Jim Dine. He did these tool drawings, which are just amazing, which influenced me an awful lot. As I said, the Derek Jarman Garden book is was fantastic to come across because I, I, you know, having having worked as a gardener for the past, you know, for the previous four summers, four or five summers, that was kind of embedded in me as well. And then Derek Jarman had, he had this fishing cottage called Prospect College in Dungeness. And I created this garden around it. And Dungeness is like, it's a very, very stony, very, very barren with specific, you know, very specific plants that will grow there. And there's a lot of driftwood about and rusty objects and things. And Derek Jarman planted this garden and then made these simple, you know, uh, sculptures out of these found things he had. And just the imagery of all that was just, uh, was really, really striking for me and sort of sort of planted the seeds of a lot of things that I do now. So that's how I started off. A lot of chance and good fortune, I think. So what kind of things, obviously people will know what you make at the minute, and if not, you know, they can go onto your website and Instagram. What kind of work were you making in your degree and then the masters that you did afterwards like has was there much transition or do you feel like you've always had a language to that as you know your language and your aesthetic has always been pretty similar i think it's 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 always developed and it's constantly developing but there's there's like there's key things that go along in the in the, in the core of it it's always been that interest uh, in materials and in in found objects and natural materials as well as fabricating you know things i like i like physically making things i would say that it, as again that that was rooted in a lot of the stuff that i started doing in foundation i was doing a lot of stuff with twigs and i was pulling things out of skips because we didn't have any money for materials so it was just kind of grabbing all that but i like you know using working with wires and stuff and bits little bits of metal and yeah but a lot of fine materials and then jewelry silversmithing and jewelry I was trying to make, yeah, you know, trying to make jewelry pieces and stuff because that's what the project would be doing. But then smithing, I really like the object types of smithing. I think it resonated with me because I felt that they were very essential, simple forms, but essential everyday forms. So I thought that they were very relatable. I like that idea of the everyday because dining, eating is, a, is an essential human activity. I like that that connection. So the utensil forms and the vessel forms, I started to explore them. It took, I mean, it, it did take a while to develop it in, in the three years of the degree. I didn't, I was starting with vessels first. I was, you know, hammering, Kara showed us how to raise, raise bowls. And I, I just love the process of that. It's very relaxing. I just like hitting the metal and making these bowls. And I think I made, for about three weeks, I just made bowls. And then Cara stopped me and went, what are you doing these for? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> but I really liked the process. So then I had to sort of figure it out. And then I started doing, I think, the second semester, second year, I started doing these um, forged woven pieces in steel, as well as uh, woven pieces in willow. And then third year third year I started thinking about utensils uh, and that kind of it, it kind of came together then if I, oh, I started doing these drawings and I, I started breaking down the structures and saw where I could make things and add element add found elements and, and explore different ways of making and different materials and stuff and do a whole series so for most people it's the last semester and third year that their work really really sort of coalesces and they start 
to find their visual language. Yeah, that was definitely the case for me. So, uh, and then after I finished my degree, I went and I worked for a while. So I was doing the gardening to support myself. And then I was also making work. I think I did a couple of years of, of making work. So, and that was all pretty much all metal work. Uh, I would do the odd, I'd maybe do one exhibition a year, which was usually the RUA and I'd put something in and it would usually be my, some of my utensil pieces with found objects and, and, and made elements. But I was doing like, you know, I was making silver bowls and silver, you know, uh, silver jugs and uh, nice forks and making jewellery and stuff. So, which was really actually very good because, well, it helped me pay the bills, but it kind of refined my skills. Because if you have to make, you know, 200 pairs of earrings, you get good at soldering. I couldn't, I, I wasn't really interested in soldering when I was at college. But, you know, when you're running your own business, you have to make the thing. So, so that was really useful to do that. And then I came back. I sort of needed to kind of get back to, to myself in a way because I was making jewellery, but I didn't really feel like I was a jeweller uh, and I wanted to express more, I think. So um, I always had that kind of sculptural material led element. So I went back to do an MA. I think the first year, it was a two year MA and the first year they were trying to get me to stop work using metal because I just went to metal straight away because it was just, you know, I'd, it, it had just been built in my head again that this is what I did and it was a sellable thing and I did I mean I did a lot of different experimental work there was a lot of drawings I was doing kind of landscape influence pieces so I wasn't using the material of the landscape I was working reflecting on it in metal and I was doing these little these wire sculptures these kind of bursts of which were like uh, swathes of grass uh, you know swathes of things that was kind of a thing that came out and I concentrated on my drawing and stuff. And then in, in the second year, I went back and I thought I was got a bit lost. I was trying to do installation work and it wasn't really working for me. And then I thought, right, I'll go back to what what worked for me in third year. Um, but this time I, I decided to do vessels. And I took a single vessel form, a cylindrical form, and I explored that with different media, different materials, different processes. And that just, everything just came alive again. So, and then, yeah, and then I left and I was like, chasing, you know, again, chasing work. So I was doing, but I was doing more exhibition type work alongside my making work and my commission work. And that's been going ever since, you know, looking for different opportunities. And it's, but it's been quite funny that in the last couple of years, some of the work I did in the first year of that uh, master's is now coming out uh, and it's coming into the installation work which I couldn't do then but I now I think the language is now starting to get developed enough where I can do it uh, or it's not uncomfortable or uh, yeah I do feel e able to kind of explore it a bit more now because I always wanted to do more than you know more than just the objects I'm always looking to create an experience which which can kind of affect people or or um, take them somewhere uh, an installation type work or an, an exhibition type work, which is more inclusive and creates a, a, a bigger space as a, as a greater experience. So it's kind of that's what I've been kind of pushing towards in my work. So, yeah, the language has just got deeper, I think, and more and has more range. And obviously, over time, my skills and my knowledge of materials has, has improved a little bit so I can do a little bit more. I can I can kind of push things a little bit further. I think it's been consistent all the way through from foundation through first, second, third year, and then those two years of the MA, you know, so, but everything's pulled in. Everything's just kind of pulled in, so. And what about, you also do illustration as well. Is that a core component to your making process? Like, do you think they go hand in hand or did that come about through trying to work on your practice as a business? The illustrations are a funny thing. I think an art practice is a funny thing. Uh, and I think it's there's lots of things I've done which while I'm doing them I haven't seen them as being connected to my art practice mm -hmm. and then I look at them again after a while and then go oh that's totally connected the illustrations the illustrations came out of me doing my sellable jewelry work so which I've always felt is disconnected from my art practice but it's not really it, it's kind of I think if I, I now look at my art practice as a spectrum, it's quite a broad thing. So um, and my illustrations would be one point on the spectrum and then the installation work, the experimental work would be at the other end. So they're all they're, they're connected. There's a continuum. 
I think they're all talking about my vision of the same place. Sort of now I see my practice as kind of world building. It's my world, vision of the world or a world. So the, the illustration is just one point, you know, one element of that. It's the fairy tale element. The sort of, I would say it's more kind of child friendly <laughs> than some of the other stuff. But the illustrations I was doing for fun and I do for fun. But they are part of it. I mean, it's it, it really does connect. It's just one way of telling a story, it's like the Disney version versus the really dark version. <laughs> but I love doing them. I love doing them both. The thing I love about the illustration work is, yes, it works as a business and it's very accessible and I can be very playful with that and very free with that. And I'm not worried about, I'm quite happy to reproduce elements of it again and again and again for people to buy into. Whereas maybe other elements of my work are very one-off and maybe they're not sellable. So it's kind of nice to have something that, you know, something for everybody and something that people can buy into literally or just, or just visually, you know. So that's how, how yeah. the illustration work sits alongside everything else. You're quite a multifaceted maker in that, you know, you have skills that are really transferable into different elements of your practice. And even like looking at your Instagram, your storyteller, each of your posts, you've like over 5,000 posts. Not many people can achieve that. But like you, equally as well, you've got over 7,000 followers and each of your posts you know, you're interacting with these environments and these materials. And then you can really visually see how that then affects the work that you're making, which they can really see this this language being translated across or being translated visually. Um, how do you feel then about uh, being on social media? You seem to be using it as like a diary or like, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I probably I probably don't use it the way I'm supposed to be using it uh, in terms of, I would say there's there's probably a lot of coaches that I would, would be, you know, Instagram coaches, social media coaches that would say you should use it a certain way. Um, and I and and that has I know that works for some people. Maybe be pushing product more or something. I don't know. I always looked at it as a as a tool for me to use for myself for my art practice. It's kind of um, it's like a second sketchbook. It's a place to it's a it's a place to express. You know, it's like well, this is and play about with ideas and put them out and um, talk a little bit about them. I mean, I'm not really. I don't feel like I'm. I feel like I'm very bad at the social aspect because I don't really chat to to my followers that much. That's my problem with social media is I'm not really that sociable. <laughs> I don't have the I just don't have the energy for it a lot of the time. It's something I find very useful and it's it's helped shape my practice. I mean, even the walking and documenting thing became a routine and became central to my practice, where it was part of my practice, but it wasn't didn't have that importance and that emphasis. So it's. It's kind of shaped it and in a very good way. Um, I'm sort of not, I try not to look at trends or algorithms or all that stuff. I try and think about about saying something and, and, and pushing something forward. And again, it's this world building of how I see things and what I'm trying to build. Just show little, little elements. Some things are work in progress. Some things are, you know, a series of snaps from my walks. Sometimes I'll talk about my swimming. Sometimes I'll do put up some illustrations or paintings or drawings. So yeah, I think it, it's a conversation. It's like it's trying to show people something good, something interesting, which I think as an artist you're always trying to do. Or oh, that's what I'm always trying to do. Maybe that's maybe more accurate as an artist. I'm trying to bring something good or interesting or powerful to people, uh, or things that I find good or interesting or powerful. I mean, I put up. Just before we chatted, I put up a series of photographs from the last three days of just from from walks and stuff. The weather's been interesting in the morning, it's been more kind of wintry than anything else. But there's still been, you know, over three days, there's still some really good, you know, really interesting things. And I was kind of excited to show people this. And that's what it's, I think that's what it stems from. It's not about hitting targets and collecting customers and clients and which which you can use social media for, but it's more about vocalizing by and visually showing what I'm about and what I'm interested in. And I think you get people buying into that as well. I mean, it's not, I try to be as me as possible. I try to use my language, not maybe the language of, of Instagram. You know, you can see some people have done these courses or they've looked really hard at what other people are doing. And you need to look at what other people are doing. I mean, I have definitely been influenced by other people on, on Instagram. But some people are using the same language. And it's not there. It's not how they speak. 
it's not them. So you don't quite get a sense of of who they are. Uh, and sometimes that's a good thing because sometimes and, so, and it's a necessary thing because maybe they're they're not pushing themselves, they're pushing a brand, and that's okay. But I'm not pushing a brand really. I'm just I'm just I'm just pushing out, trying to. I'm using it as a place to be creative, you know. And further, it's an aspect of my creative practice, you know, for me. So, and it's a tool. It's a it's a tool that that makes me focus because you have to write a, if you have to put a post up, you have to think about what you're at and what you're doing. And so it always. It's I, I find it many times it's very good to root me in my practice because it makes me put something up and, and consider what I'm about and what I'm interested in and or what's on my desk and you know maybe I don't have anything to show well maybe I should sit and do some drawings so then I'll sit and do some drawings and then I have a set of drawings out of it and I'll maybe put a few up. I think sometimes people don't see that it can be a really useful tool for them just for their creativity so that's what I mean but I've been on it for a long time. I mean when I started off using it I didn't even realize it was a social media pro- platform. I just saw it as a, um, oh, you can use these cool filters on your photographs, on your phone. Uh, that's all I thought. So I was putting these pictures up. And then one of my friends said, yeah, I'm following you on Instagram. And I was like, you're, what? <laughs> and they said, yeah, it's a social media <laughs> platform. I was like, it is? <laughs> yeah, you can go into it. Have you not known that? And I said, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah. But this was, I don't know how many years ago this was. This is a photographer friend of mine. So, um, And the first photographs were awful. So, yeah, I'm gonna have to it's, scroll uh, through those five thousand posts to see what the original yeah, ones are. Yeah, <laughs> not, and it's not worth it. So don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose because of how you use it, Instagram, it kind of gives you an insight into you and uh, your making process and everything. But what would be a typical day for you? Like, you seem like quite a person who would be into a routine. You know, you seem to go for your swims and painting and your making. Would that be a daily thing, or is your day quite? vary depending on projects and exhibitions and um yeah i mean i i I do really like routine it's been a bit broken up recently because of the whole covid thing and the lockdown thing that sort of changed things up and and then i got into a new routine with that and and now we're out of it and now i sort of i feel like i'm kind of out of routine again because i'm not quite in the one i was in before i have two spaces i have a studio in my house and then i have a workshop which is away from my house, which is about 10 miles away at uh, my aunt's house. Before lockdown, I would have got up and had my normal breakfast and stuff and do my, you know, I do stretches and stuff in the mornings and just things to kind of set. I have, I would have caught what I would have said would have been soft mornings where I would have start, started slowly, read a little bit of poetry, put my head in a good place, done some, you know, sort of stretches and things and had breakfast. And then then I would go up to the studio room and I would do some drawing or fit around because I'd be thinking, I'd be thinking about Instagram going, it'd be good to put something up. So I'd start doing some drawings and it depends. I go through phases of landscapes and then also doing phases of objects. So we do those, photograph those, and then I would usually do some stuff online. And then later in the day, I would go, go to my workshop and either before or after I would go for a walk, take some photographs and collect, maybe collect some things if I see anything interesting. So this would be down by the sea. My studio was about five minutes from the sea and then I'd probably go in for a swim and then I'll go back to the workshop if I haven't been there and then I'll start working on whatever I'm working on. So it could be, could be exhibition work or it could be jewellery work for sale or it could be commission. So it could be any of those three things. But yeah, there'll be a couple of hours studio time and then I'll come home and then get up to the next day and do it all over again so yeah so that's that's what it, it was it tends to be like the drawing the drawing comes and goes as well though so there's some days where there's some periods where i'm drawing more and i'm not really interested in making sculptural objects i'm just doing drawing and i'm gonna be going in and just doing my cellular jewelry work but i think at the moment this sort of switched to i don't particularly have a big drive to draw or paint at the moment it's not really there but i'm starting to make again which i haven't been making properly for for a couple of months so um so yeah it sort of changes but there's there's that kind of steady thing of going for a walk going for a swim collecting things photographing things getting to the workshop for a couple of hours you know so but it's good to kind of struct i mean it's it's imposed structure it's like well i I sort of make myself go right i've got to go and do all those things tick those boxes and then it's a good day and it's that thing of you are what you do repeatedly so it's just putting in habits that you want to the swimming thing was i wanted to be someone who swam every day so i swim every day no so do Um, drawings every day and you know and i've always maintained as well is 
if you just make your creative practice your life, then it's easy just to pull the work out of it. You know what I mean? So if you build a life that generates creativity and, and ideas and, and things, then it's just, it makes it a lot easier. You're not kind of fighting to get into that space. That's just who you are and that's how you live. So which that's how it works for me. And obviously, as I mentioned earlier, this is not our first time recording your wonderful self on this podcast. We were lucky enough to go down and see your studio. Could you describe your studio and your making processes that you're able to achieve because of the machinery and tools that you have? The workshop is, I've had a workshop done in my aunt's for, well, since I left, left college after my degree. I think I've had about, yeah, um, maybe about six months after leaving I managed to get a, a workshop and at the time it was just like a, an outbuilding which they'd previously used as a stable so it was pretty rough but it was mine and it was a great place and stuff and I had a great old time and then they recently redeveloped it so I have um and I got a new space and it's got a window and a sink and a door and it's warm which is a new experience and plenty of light. It's a long space it's it's, it's maybe two and a half meters wide something like that Um, But it's quite deep um, and I have benches down either side, uh, heavy benches, which I can work on. One one set of benches is a jewellery bench and I have two different torches. So I've got a big heavy torch for doing smithing work on larger pieces. And then I've got a fine torch for doing fine jewellery work. General jewellery tools for things like pen and motors and stuff and drills, which all kind of cross over me doing my fine sculpture work. Guillotine, rolling mill for working working down a uh, sheet, you know, metal sheet into finished sort of layers. I'm putting texture on. I've got silversmithing stakes, anvils for, for forming over. So I can do medium scale metal work in there um, pretty easily, pretty comfortably. So, yeah, I mean, that's when I do a lot of the, you know, the metal work making and stuff and assembly of the jewellery and the objects. I would do other things at my, my, my house I'd be working with. If I'm forming up leaves or seaweed or something like that, I probably do it in the house where it's drier and there's there's more space, I think, to put stuff out. I mean, the, the studio, I'm quite hectic and not very tidy when it comes to my studios and my workshops. So um, any space I, I am given, I will take over and infect and cover. That's that's how the spaces work. So they're, they're generally pretty busy. The workshop, uh, even though it's predominantly metal, will have an awful lot of found objects scattered all around the place. I have a few things on the wall and stuff, and I have a the black the back wall is um, a blackboard. I put blackboard paint on it so I can do I can make notes on it. I usually put an illustration up on in chalk, and uh, but I can also do drawings, larger drawings and stuff on the thing uh, on the board if I'm trying to figure some things out, which I did last year. I was trying to come up with some some really simple vessel shapes. So I just did a couple of quick drawings and then that they they worked really quickly. So I just left them up for about a month or two while I made the pieces. So it was, that was pretty good. Could you tell us a bit more about your making processes then? Like things that you've maybe tried that you haven't taken on. You said at uni you tried a bit of jewellery and it just wasn't for you. Being in different smithing processes and obviously you've got stakes in the studio as well. Um, and you also do some amazing work with steel wire as well, which yeah. isn't something that that's common within a lot of people's practices. So it'd be great to hear about that. And also, could you just kind of, I mean, like I'm kind of hearing this from a ceramics point of view, that I really don't have that language. And whenever you're yeah. talking about steaks, I know both Not of you are vegan. Of yeah. Yes. <laughs> but like, <laughs> could you just describe what a steak <coughs> is? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So that that's a lot of questions. Um, okay, so <laughs> silversmithing generally is the tradition of producing tableware in precious metals. The main two object types are vessels or hollowware, so that bowls, jugs, those sorts of things, and flatware, which is cutlery, knives, forks, spoons. There are a few other things around that candelabra, that sort of thing. Of the dress table. So they're very domestic objects, but they're made generally in, in um, very precious metals. And um, and then there's, so there's an association with wealth and stuff with that. And it could be quite ostentatious. But I, I sort of, I like the kind of domestic, functional, everyday nature of the object types. Vessels, when we talk about stakes, we're talking about big chunks of metal formed a certain way. So they're formers that you hammer uh, metal round to to get them to be hollow, you know, to become up to to make these hollow forms. 
of bowls. And I quite like hammering up. It's quite a, you know, you use this process of, it's a circular hammering process of blocking out or doming where you're driving the metal down, forming a, a shallow dish, and then you flip it over and you hammer the top surface, pushing it down towards the stake. Um, that's called raising. And then you use planishing to take some of the, you know, make the shape more regular and take some of the hammer marks out. Or in my case, put extra marks on. So that's generally the process. Um, and I like to mess around with that. But I'm not too precious with, oh, it has to be shiny and, you know, look expensive. It's I like working with materials. I sort of, pre- I'm precious with all materials. Uh, even if it's some bit of plastic I find by the sea. Because it, I sort of see those things as a one-of-a-kind thing. Because even if, even if you drop the same thing into the sea countless times it'll come out differently because it'll be smashed up a different way and it'll discolor a different way and it'll shape itself a different way just like all the little pebbles on the sea are slightly different so i sort of see them as as precious as anything that i fabricate in silver um so in terms of my practice in making i'll explore vessels and utensil shapes i use those forms in a loose way to make objects um, and what I like to do is I'll, I'll, when I'm out in my walks I, I collect uh, different materials, different fine things, the discarded things, um, things that have been washed up on the beach, natural materials, things that have fallen from trees or washed up from the sea, different shells, things like that. And I find these fascinating so I want to I want to kind of hi- highlight how fascinating these are. So I put them in a different context to sort of show off their, some of their qualities. So I'll put them into the context of a recognisable shape of a utensil or a vessel. And what I do is usually I fabricate other elements to go with them. So I make things in silver generally because it's, it's a really nice material. It's very malleable, easy to move. And I'll make little shapes and I'll look at interesting ways of connecting them. I like to not use glue. I like to, you know, put rivets or stitches or binding them with linen thread quite often. And the reason for that is I love using hand processes because I think it really puts the humanity into the object. It puts the person into the object and it's another way of people can connect with the, with, with the work and with the object because they can kind of see it was made by someone similar to themselves. You know, it looks like it was a human hand. It doesn't look like it's popped out of a machine. I know some some craft makers are very keen to do high standard of making where you can't see the human hand in it, but I'm I'm of the opposite. Uh, I sort of like to, to show the human hand and the process in it as much as possible. So a lot and a lot of my work is quite left, left quite raw. So you'll see saw marks and you'll see solder joints and file marks and things because I love that process because it gives it also gives the the object um, a bit of life it's been it's been through things to get to where it is in front of your eyes really you know that's how I sort of approach making them and I, I usually pick out something that I want to work with I want to produce and then I'll start doing little drawings to see what shapes complement the, the the object I find and I'll maybe make little elements and then try them out against different pieces that I find to see what works and what doesn't so it's all about finding balance and connection and things that are compatible in some way, whether they contrast each other or complement each other, you know. And sometimes those are made in pairs, so that there's like black and white pairs or very solid things and very ephemeral, thin, thin things. Going back to the wire work, well, the wire work, it's, a, it's like 3D drawing, really. A lot of time I sketch out and I, and I sketch loosely and with lots of lines. Wire just make, allows you to do that in 3D. Um, so I quite like these... Because I like the suggestion of things. The suggestion, you know, all the things they make. Say I made a fork. It's it's the suggestion of a fork. It doesn't look like a functional fork. It's not exactly like a fork, but it kind of looks like a fork. So the suggestion of things, the implied nature of things, leaves it up to the viewer to complete it, to go, oh, that's a fork, or that reminds me of. So the more ambiguity you leave, the more the, the viewer gets to add their own version to the story. You know, it's quite, I love, I do quite like hearing what people see in the work because a lot of times it's not what I thought they would see in the work uh, or, or even what was in my head, but they, they see it as a very definite thing to them. And they're usually delighted by it, which is always, which is a really nice thing as well. You know, they've, they've always, this is a, you know, I made a piece and it, to me it was like a little ladle and, and this guy was like, that's a pipe, that's a pipe, isn't it? And I was like, it is if 
really that's what you see it and he said yeah it's an old man's pipe and it's like okay yeah <laughs> and and he was but he was loving how it was put together and everything and he was telling me all this that and the other thing about it which was which was great um and then the, you know when someone starts telling you a story about the piece then they start owning the piece in a, in a way so that's 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 uh, that's kind of a, uh, an exciting moment as an artist to, to hear those stories. The wire work, it comes from the drawing, um, and it was uh, what I talked about earlier when I was doing my MA. In the first year, I did a lot of wire work. It was, that's when I started working with, with steel wire. And I was doing these larger pieces that were kind of related to these drawings. And, and I left that for, for maybe 10 years at least. But then in the last couple of years, it started coming back and I've started making these other things out of it. And I'm building landscapes now and that's becoming, can be on a small scale around an object, around a, a component that I've made. I'm building bits of the landscape in, in in steel wire. So it's these very fine lines or it's these structures that I've maybe imag- seen or imagined or half remembered for something. And very often it's stuff that's been coming out of, that's been popping up in my paintings and my drawings, which I haven't really understood why I was doing it, but I really liked I mean, that happened in an exhibition I did last year. I was putting, they wanted some imagery to go with it so that they liked, they wanted to show some of my drawings and some of my photography. And then these new objects and I was putting the things together and I just went, oh, right, oh, right, okay, that's where that, that fits in now. And I didn't really, I mean, this, these were things I'd been doing years, you know, a few years before and hadn't really understood it. But I didn't stop and question, is this really part of my practice? I just let it go. And now it fits in perfectly. I only see the value, you know, how it fits in a couple of years later. So, so yeah, so the steel work is, came, came out of doing that first year of MA. And I was probably looking at a lot of sculptors at the time. Um, and probably some textile artists as well, and some weavers and things. It's a way of drawing in 3D which I really, really like. But I mean, I, I sort of think of all my work as drawing anyway, sort of sketching out things and just using different types of marks. Some of them are very solid and some of them are quite ephemeral and light. And you've done some amazing exhibitions as well. Like I know the, thing, the first time I ever met you was at Collect and stuff in the V&A and over in Gallery Ra. How do you find those opportunities? Like do people come to you for them or is it sort of a bit of a mixture of how they come about? It's a mixture. The Collect was, Collect probably put the groundwork in for a lot of the exhibitions I did later. And how I got Collect was... I applied at the time the National Craft Gallery of Ireland would take its portfolio makers over and show it collect. They don't do that anymore. They stopped doing it for a couple of years ago. Portfolio is like um, you apply for it as a maker. So you so you know, you submit your C V and an artist statement and images of your work. And then they take you you submit physical work for them to look at and a panel of experts looks at it and they select, I think, I don't know, ten to twenty makers. It's sort of the top makers in Ireland, or a selection of the top makers in Ireland, probably more accurately, because not all, there's some brilliant makers who, who don't put in for it, or who aren't selected because they want to obviously spread it around a little bit and, and let other makers get opportunities. And I applied for that. I wasn't sure about it, and one of my friends, Gail Mann, she just gave me, she, we were chatting one day, and she just said, look, just, just stick something in. I think you should put in for it. So the dead, we had this conversation at lunchtime. The deadline was at 5 o'clock that day, and I just fired something in and, and managed to get. I didn't make the full, there's a book list of portfolio makers, and then there's the web list, which is which is broader, which has more makers on it. I made the, the web list. Um, but then the, they had a curator come in to select t- people's work to take to collect. Uh, and she selected my work. So I, I got to, to send some work over and then I got to go over and, um, and sort of be there and chat to people. So, and at the time it was quite, you met lots of people, but um, it's a weird one because it was amazing to be there, but you weren't, you were sitting going, well, I haven't been. No one was handing out offers for exhibitions or frantically trying to buy up your work. So you're still going with this, you know, has this gone well? But what I found was I've had opportunities since where the conversation with the curator or gallery owner was, I saw your work at Collect, or we talked at Collect. I got into a shoot with Ra because I had a chat with Paul Derez there a little bit, and he looked at my work. And then I talked to him again when he came to Belfast. He was doing, um, he was a, uh, what was he? 
it was like an invigilator or external external um, examiner for the for the course, and we had a chat, and he said, well, maybe you should send me some work. I'll, I'd like to try in the gallery, so I, I sent him some work off the back of that, and um, I did a work, and then I did an exhibition in Sweden, where it's um, a small gallery. It's like a co-op of of makers over there. They invite um, one artist a year from outside to come and show with them. Two of their members had seen my work at Collect, so they invited me to, to show there. So I did that, that, and again, I wasn't sure who saw that and stuff. It's a small exhibition in Stockholm, and I wasn't really sure. It was great, and it was fantastic get over there. It was a lovely wee space, met some fantastic people, and came back and went, well, I don't know, don't know how that went. But then recently, last year, I did a I did a show with um, Hauser & Worth Make, or Make at Hauser & Worth, I think that's correct terminology and the curator of that and the partner mark seeing that exhibition in stockholm so that's how she knew my work and um, they sort of followed me on instagram and then invited me to do the show there so that was a two-person show with adam buick so um ceramic is now buick and that was that was brilliant so that was kind of an amazing show to do uh, though there is a bit of applying for things getting opportunities there's a lot of not getting up applying for things and not getting opportunities still you know uh, there was one year i applied for <clears throat> everything i applied for none of it I, I didn't even get shortlisted for any of it it, it happens but then sometimes people come looking for you because they've seen you've taken those opportunities you've applied for those opportunities they've seen your work at it and then something comes up and they think oh i remember that guy's work and they come looking for you so it's kind of but it takes it takes a long time to build up you mentioned your friend Gail Mahan, and we know that you were in an arts collective with her with Mac Nine. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about that project? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good one. Well, uh, I done my I done my masters, and I met um, Heather Dorian Wilson, who's another um, maker. She's a sort of multimedia maker, really. She does. She seems to go from textiles to jewelry to glass to photography to light to you, you, you know, to performance and and Gail's uh, Gail's very similar. She's a ceramic. Her background is ceramics. She's very interested in movement, performance, uh, sculptural work, and she's now looking at documenting things, creating small films and and, and photographs. But we come out of the masters, and you, we were we'd see ourselves as applied artists rather than maybe traditional craft people. We weren't making nice object for people to buy and put in their homes or we if we were that wasn't our central central practice we had this very expressive practice which was rooted in making and process and materials and materiality but the problem was the art fine art crowd didn't really see us as art enough and the craft crowds thought we were too arty so there wasn't really enough for all the opportunities to do this interesting work so heather and i were a bit frustrated about it and then this um and then Gail came back. She'd been in Manchester, and she kind of stomped into the, <laughs> into the, uh, into the arena. And at the time, Craft and I were doing. They they were doing this. Um, I think it was August Craft Month, and they got some really really interesting curators and and, and exhibitions over. The slow craft movement was involved. Jeroen Vetberg was over giving a talk. Christoph Zellweger was over at the same similar sort of time. So, just a few things came together, and Christoph did a. Um, Christoph did a three-day workshop with Kraft and I, and it was Christoph's brilliant because he basically just throws a grenade into the room and then walks away <laughs> and just asks a few questions and then smirks and walks off. And you're all going, yeah, what, what, what are we doing? Why are we doing this? And um, he doesn't really give you any, he doesn't give you any answers. He, he gives you questions and then that sets your head off, you know. So, so and Gail and Heather and I were chatting and chatting and chatting. And then we thought, and one of the things that had been come up was artist collectives doing their own thing and, and pushing things the way they they wanted and creating opportunities they, they wanted so we thought we'd do the same thing so and hence mac9 was was born so um and mac9 is that it was a play on the word make just with the e turned into a nine it you know, sort of turned around a little bit and we were looking to per, you know to create opportunities for us to do work but also for other people to do work and for other people to see applied art in different contexts so we started doing things we did we had a lot of fun uh doing stuff we did we did craft conversation where we showed we showed uh work in a in a restaurant in, in a restaurant um and in a coffee shop an alternative coffee shop 
which was fun, which was a bit challenging. And we learned, we made a lot of mistakes and we did some, but we learned a lot and we did some really cool things with it. We, we worked with photographer Kai Davenport and did some really good imagery out of it and stuff. And we gave a bunch of people an opportunity to, to do different work. And we did the Mac 9 Exchange, which was fun as well, which where we got a whole rake of different crafts, people and makers from all different levels, you know, from people doing very expressive, very sort of out there work. We had like kind of models going around wearing capes and things that people had made. And um, we had people doing demos. We had produced a little film and then and, and had community groups and things in it. And then we just invited loads of people. So I think, I don't know, I think it was just, st- I remember seeing stacks and stacks of people coming through and it started a lot of different conversations. And then we did a couple of other exhibitions off that, which were site specific um, in non-gallery spaces. So we did one, um, we did one in our space in there when they were still um, renovating the upper floors. Um, we showed the sort of prep work downstairs in the gallery space, but upstairs it was this kind of old Victorian building, which was um, which was all kind of run down and and, um, and hadn't been, been sort of disused for a long time. Um, and we had people installing work in these spaces. So there's dust and old, you know, sinks and things and peeling wallpaper and the odd pigeon. And some of the makers just came along and just did these fantastic things. The pigeon thing was really funny because my friend, um, my friend did a... Uh, she took the image of the of the pigeon and made she's a printmaker um lucy turner and she did this uh she did uh pigeon wallpaper and we got it wallpapered onto the one of the old fireplaces and it just looked fantastic and of course the pigeon would come in during you know during the thing so so um when we had all sorts of things going on and that was fantastic and then we did another one up in Derry at the Dean's residence. So there was a basement in there. It was again a really old building. The the basement hadn't been used in I don't know how long. It was just full of dust and old things and old props. And um, but the building was I don't know maybe 100, 200 years old. <clears throat> and we all and we did again. We got a lot of makers and you know there was makers and different. There was a, a painter who made the, his objects out of um, laser cut cardboard, um, and he did different things and. Some of the makers that had done the area project came in and did the second one, and they'd obviously learned from that. And and we were always looking to interact with the with the audience different ways. So we would do tours where we would take them around and we would explain, you know, talk about the work and explain it and uh, answer questions. Lucy had done had done uh, rats. She'd taken this idea of the rat, which had been part of the um, siege of Derry. Um, Rats had been like uh, currency almost for food. <laughs> so she took that and the idea of graffitied rats and stuff. And she made these little steel rats and, and printed on top of them. And then we hid them throughout the basement. And uh, we got kids. We give kids um, little torches. And we they, they ran around counting, you know, how many rats could they find? So so they were going around this, this um, installation, playing, but seeing and looking, countering work in a different way. And um, I, I say we did this. It was it was Heather Heather and Gail predominantly did those sorts of things. They were really good at, at doing that kind of community interaction, which was great. But it was a tough thing to do. It's quite demanding when you do exhibitions. You have a lot of organising and manning spaces and stuff like that. And since then, we've 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 all sort of been very busy doing our own things, our own practices. And Gail has a seems to be involved in numerous things. So. Um, we haven't done done anything in a long time, but yeah, that was that was really good. It was very formative, and that I think that changed my practice as well. Because I had to do, you had to get out of your very out of your comfort zone. I mean, if you're in these derelict spaces, you have to put something that has presence in those spaces and that has to respond to those spaces. So, as one of the organisers, as well as being an, an exhibitor, you have a lot of pressure on your time to to run the exhibition, put the exhibition on. So you don't have a lot of time to make the work, so it's trying to fit everything in. So, uh, but it was great, you know, really, really good. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that. Brilliant. Um, it seems like such a bizarre world. Obviously, we're in the middle of COVID, and the idea of having exhibitions and interacting with people just seems so bizarre. So I suppose the next question is, how has COVID affected you and your daily life and your practice? Well, first thing was at the start of the year, 
I put up on my blackboard in the workshop, you know, exhibitions that I had to do, you know, that I was going to send. And I had about five lined up, which is a good number. And then they all started getting cancelled. When it started to pick up, um, I was supposed to do Schmuck in Germany with a group of Irish jewellers. That cancelled, that got cancelled. I was supposed to send some work over to the Netherlands for an exhibition. That's been postponed till October. There's a couple of others that I did get to send some work out to Japan just before the lockdown. So um, so that went ahead. So there's a wee gallery in Tokyo that, that um, Pragmata that uh, has a little set of my work, which was brilliant. I was really pleased to get some work out to them. But there's basically all of a sudden everything shut down and, you know, opportunities to earn suddenly, suddenly closed. Some of the exhibitions, well, you, they might be going on, they might not. They're, they're sort of scheduled for later on in the year, but you know, there's not there's a great deal of uncertainty as to whether they're going to go ahead. And um, so, yeah, basically, all, all of a sudden, even though as an artist I'm generally used to uncertainty, the uncertainty levels went up massively. Yeah. As well as that, your movement's restricted. So, I did get out, you know, for my daily exercise, my daily walk. I was never relaxed enough to kind of wander and pick up and photograph. And so I did take a couple of photographs and stuff a day, but I always was checking the time and thinking that I really shouldn't be out for very long. And you were obviously very aware of avoiding people. So, so that was kind of, it stopped my collecting. And I also, I stopped making and I didn't really draw um, because all of a sudden, well, there was nothing to work f- towards, you know, as far as I could see. And the most immediate thing was, oh, how are you going to pay the bills for the next couple of months? Because I knew it was going to be a couple of months. So I just started focusing on pure commission work, which is, you know, just making jewellery that would sell, for, you know, to sell and working on the, getting some prints out that people were ordering and that sort of thing. So my art pro- practice basically... I just I just didn't have any interest, didn't want to look at it. It was just survival and, you know, getting back, just really focusing on the commercial work completely. Um, as well as that, I actually got a mild dose of COVID at the start. I think I didn't, I couldn't get tested. You know, at that period, there wasn't really testing. And you didn't go to hospital unless you were severely, you know, uh, struggling with it. And fortunately, I wasn't severely struggling with it, but it did. I had it for about five days and it was really tough. And it really, even just those five days, and I took another couple of days before I went out, staying socially just the whole time. But I was exhausted afterwards. I mean, it it, um, it took me it took me a long time to get fitness back, and I was very breathless afterwards. Um, that sort of knocked the wind out of me. And then also because I'd taken time off because I was sick, that knocked all my commissions off. And uh, and then all the suppliers have been sort of either working on very very minimum staff or not working at all. It's been tough. Uh, I think there's a lot of there's been a lot of stress with you know can you know are, are you going to get opportunities again? Are you going to be able to pay the bills and, and dealing with that massive uncertainty? It's very hard, very very hard to create work. And it, it was a funny time as well because people were saying, oh, well, artists should be doing stuff and you should be providing online content and people need art now. And I really didn't feel like doing any of that. You know, I mean, I also would say. Um, I was in a very good position because I'd just been paid just before lockdown happened. So I had a, a, unusually for me, I had a bit of money in the bank, a little bit of money in the bank. So that actually gave me a bit of security for the first wee while. And then finishing jobs, I was able to keep topping it up. It's a very precarious life anyway. So all the all the uncertainty just kind of blew it up tenfold, you know. So um yeah, it's been pretty tough, um, but I feel like I'm sort of getting back to things now. I've sort of, I still haven't reestablished my routine, but I'm, I've got my interest back in my practice. And the Arts Council of Northern Ireland launched um, an emergency funding stream for for COVID for artists, and um, I was really lucky to be one of the few people to get at, you know, to get some of that money and, and got a small grant. So I've got some money to do some new work. So I'm sort of starting. So it's little things that have there's been bubbling away. I'm going to try and bring forward and reinvest in. I'm hoping to do to sort of build a digital com- content of what's available. So I've been thinking about doing a, a zine, sort of trying to capture the walking, the making, the objects, the photography, 
in some way and put it into a document so it's sort of a zine type thing and maybe make that downloadable as well as making a physical one available so that was an idea i had to have to see how the how it all works out but that's the grand plan so but it's definitely i still don't really know what exhibitions are, are, are going to come on again and and you don't know how galleries are going to recover and how the market's going to recover so yeah it's been it's been pretty tough i think um yeah, I think you just don't look too far ahead. You just sort of concern yourself with, with what you've got on that week. Well, first of all, congratulations on getting that funding. That's amazing. You have been awarded funding before. You were the recipient of the Rosie James Memorial Trust Award and you've had your work purchased by the Arts Council before as well. Would you say that that is more of a bonus in your practice or how reliant would that be, those kind of funding channels? Well, yeah, we're big. I mean, it's a big bonus. Um, like most people, I'm juggling what I do. You know, I have to, you know, I have to make money to to live essentially. So, if I get money through my practice, then that makes it easier to to put more time into my practice. If I don't, I have to make other jewelry, which takes me away from from the core. You know, my 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 main main practice part. So, the Rosie James was exceptional because i mean it was at the time it was fifteen thousand pounds which is a massive amount of money to me i think it's a, it would be a massive amount of money to any maker and it really it almost allowed me to take almost an entire year off uh, out just to make some new work and to play about with things and um it was basically a year of research i mean i did make some i made, it made quite a lot of work but again it's one of those things where it allows you to investigate and, and um, elements of your practice and, and try things out that maybe don't work fully at the time, but start, but just have a knock-on effect later on. Um, so yeah, I mean the, the Rosie James thing was massive, and um, and then getting your work bought by collectors, whether it's for public collection or a private collection, again that's massive. You know, it's a big. It's a big shot in the arm. And what I've found in the last couple of years is increasingly that's becoming more, I'm selling more work. I'm getting more collected. Uh, and that means I can, I can sort of push more into my, into my practice and, and, um, and develop but more, you know, the more time you put into anything, the better you get at it, the, the better the work is. And, um, obviously where I'm happiest as well is the work I really love doing so yeah I mean it's massive when people buy into your work uh, whether it's you know buying a drawing or a painting or something small or whether it's um it's a grant or it's um it's a larger purchase for a collection I mean I did the make the Hazard and Worth exhibition and um the Worths actually bought a collection of my work off the back of that which was Brilliant. Stunning, yeah. I mean, it was um, it was absolutely amazing. I mean, last year was really, really, really amazing for that. So, but obviously, COVID hit, so we don't know where we where we're going to be at for the next the next wee while. But fingers crossed. But it, you know, I mean, I make the work anyway. It just gives you. It's easier to make the work in favourable conditions. You you know, and you can make more of it. You can get more. It can become deeper. But even that, now I'm sort of going, well, I don't know whether anyone's going to buy me work, but I've got all this work planned I'm going to do anyway, you know, and and I'm really, really thankful to get that grant because that, that's just made it easier. I mean, I was going to try and do the work, but it would have been more restricted and I would, would have, you know, struggled to get the materials in that I needed and struggled to take time away from commission work and jewellery work to, to to do the, put the time in. But um, because that grant, that means I can I can definitely set aside time to do the work. And I can buy in the materials that I want to do, you know, to make the things. So it's really, it's really massive. But, um, and you get, to get grants, you have to practice applying, you know, I mean, you have to do these applications and you have to build up that skill of um, learning how to pitch yourself and pitch an idea to them. Some people were, well, I remember reading on Facebook groups and stuff that people were struggling with it and were a bit frightened of it. And it can be a bit, intimidating but if but actually i've always found if you contact the arts council um they're very good at giving you advice on what you need to do to help to get it whether it is how you write and present what you do or maybe it's how you build up your profile so maybe it's trying to do exhibitions and and it could be and it could be exhibitions that you then you know if you can't get into one that you want or you don't see the ones there that you want maybe you make them up yourself 
you know, you form a group or do a, do a solo show or you have to, but it's, it's part of the work, you know, you have to build towards getting those things to get people collecting your work. They're collecting your work because they like your work, but they also see that you've invested your time into it. So they're happy to invest their money, into it, which is their time. You know, they see that this has been going for 10 years, it's evident in the work. Um, and they can look back and see how much work you've been doing over the last 10 years that they see that this is this is worth worth buying into. It's not something you've knocked up and fired out, you know what I mean? So um, I think that's a good point to make. Sometimes people get a bit frustrated or they think they don't see how much work goes into to getting getting to a place where you can you can get a grant from the arts council or you can get bought into their collection. It's, it's off the back of a lot of work you've been doing. It's not like an overnight success thing, really. You know, I mean, I'm, I graduated 20 years ago, you know, so it's, and now it's starting to pay off, or it was, <laughs> until COVID, so yeah. So that's kind of, there's no quick fix. You've got to bust your ass, basically, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. Whenever you were talking about using, like, the stakes, plenishing and raising things, it all sounds really massively labour intensive and I know a lot of craft is but are there any health complications that you would have because of that because I mean if you're how often would you do that or do you have to say to yourself oh I can't do that every day because it's so physically intensive um yes <laughs> is the well how I hammer probably isn't particularly healthy um <laughs> I did a workshop with Addy Talk and uh, she <laughs> she actually commented because we were doing raising and she couldn't look at me raising because she just thought it looked painful which was really funny because you can use you can use the weight of the hammer but I tend to just you know wheel away at it a little yeah. bit um, but yeah um, all especially as we get older the jewellery work the smithing work takes its toll I mean I don't do an awful lot of smithing work. It, it's like raising. I, I really enjoy it as a process, but it, when I start doing it at first, it's usually the, the next day I wake up and my body's going, what have you just done? It's usually, I'm usually aching, but it can get into a little bit and then it's not so bad. And, and probably also I, I slow down and I, I relax a little bit and I don't put as much energy into each hit. I sort of let them, the hammer do the work. But uh, I also have had like repetitive strain injury a few times where my my arms are just ached um, from from and my hands ache sometimes from from doing work if I'm doing engraving work for the jewelry it can be really hard on my hands and my wrist and I have ME so I I really only have like three four good hours in me a day so um, I try to spend two or three of those in the workshop four or five days a week and then try and rest the rest of the time. Yeah, I mean it's 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 tough. But the other thing is, you, you know, you prior you do it because it's I do it because it's the most important thing to me, really. So that's what I, I put my time into, and that's what I put my energy into, and um, it's the most important thing. So yeah, you definitely have to look after yourself. You know, I, I do stretches every day to watch my posture and stuff because my you know, and to make sure I'm stretching up my back because your back can cramp up because you're hunched over a hunched over a bench trying to make things and as much as I try and adjust my posture while I'm making uh, it, it's I'm just more interested in the making and, and I sacrifice that so but I, I have to the payoff is I have to go and stretch and stuff in, in the mornings and things so yeah but I try and do you know to facilitate those couple of hours making I, I do put an emphasis on self-care and and um that's the other aspect of the walks and the swimming is it's self-care really it's really it's very relaxing it gives me space to think things out and it's really about taking care of yourself if you don't take care of yourself you can't do the work you know and then if you can't do the work then you're really unhappy so you take care of yourself so you can do the work and you can keep doing the work i mean you can work i mean i can work in small bursts um very intensively but i have to really make sure i, I really really i eat really well and i rest an awful lot like I just get home and I just I'm on the sofa and that's it. I'm not moving, and I'm not reading anything. I'm just taking in very very minimal amounts of information and just distracting myself and, until I get up and do it again the next day. So, yeah, I think that's um, brilliant. I know a lot of uh, we've just recorded another podcast, and I think it's really hard to switch off. And as you said earlier, as a maker or a creative, it 
is who you are and it's your entire life. So I think a lot of people find it difficult to find that balance within their life, their yeah. creative yeah. exports. And, yeah. I mean, especially if you live alone and, um, you know, it can be all goal consuming, but it's not healthy. You know, it's good to have hobbies and interests that are just not work. And actually, when I got ME and I got L and I couldn't work at all initially, um, I had to distract myself from that. So I had to look at stuff that just wasn't art or making or craft. You know, I just had to switch off completely from it. So so I've kept, you know, I've kept that to a degree. But yeah, I think it's really important that people have, you know, maintain. Because it's very easy to beat yourself up going, well, I really shouldn't be doing this frivolous thing. I should be making or I should be thinking about work stuff or I should be writing that email or working on my website. But no, you shouldn't. You need to, you know, you need to stare off into the distance and forget about everything, really. And, uh, you know, most days, give yourself a break and have, you know, we don't, I think, I think we don't put enough emphasis on recovery and rest, looking yeah. after ourselves. I think there's, there's, there's generally been a push too much to, you have to do all the things all the time because your phone's on all the time and your computer's on all the time and you get notifications and you need to switch all those things off and you need to have space away from your work because the space away is where is where you recover where you generate all the ideas that goes into the work um, and recovers the mental and creative energy to go into the work i mean if you just keep battering away at, you know at your practice you'll start you'll hit a wall because you can't you've got you're not feeding it with anything you need, you're not giving it space to kind of grow and you know beyond just sleeping you need you need something else you need to be able to switch off whether it's you know play a computer game for a couple of hours read a book um go see some films chat with your mates support a you know sports team whatever it's good to have something that's completely not not work it could be another creative thing it could be knitting or you know if you're if i'm not a knitter I don't stitch, but I, I sewed a few things. I sewed some patches on my jeans during lockdown. So, and that was very, very relaxing. And it wasn't work. It was just like, oh. so, um, yeah. yeah, you know, but yeah, I don't, I think, I think self-care is really key and taking, taking space and time away from homework is vital. I know that a lot of makers, whenever they're in the community of craft, they know all these other makers and that's their support. But in terms of family, I know that like my family have no idea what I do. You know, they whenever I was telling them I was doing a ceramics degree, they were like, brilliant, you're making cups and whatever. And that was totally the complete opposite. They have no idea. Um, whereas now, actually, I am making cups. So that's just really confusing. So, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so do, would you say that your family have a grasp of what exactly it is that you do or what your practice is and how supportive are they of, of what you do? No, they have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> to be to be blunt I mean they know I make jewelry and I can make jewelry for them mm. and I make nice things but I they don't really talk to them about the work and I don't um they don't really they don't really get it I'm I'm, I'm a very much the outlier in my family so I, I find it easier if I don't talk to them about my work it's more because usually I get very helpful you know encouraging things like you know what you should sell your work for five pounds that'll you know that's the really way to go sell lots of things for five okay then you know um and none of them are i mean none of them have none of them really have any relevant experience none of them are creative none of them run their own business well my brother does but he's you know he's doing his own thing so no i don't really talk to my family about it i think they're, i mean they're, they're sort of they don't understand it you know um my, I mean, my dad, my dad was always really funny. He would always say, I don't, I don't understand what you do, you're doing, but I think it's very good that you're doing it. I mean, he doesn't understand, you know, he didn't understand. He definitely doesn't know. I mean, he's got dementia. He just about knows who I am. No, he doesn't know what I, I do know. He, yeah, I mean, he would have, he would have been quite honest with that. Going, I don't, I don't understand it, but you know, well done, keep going. Um, and I suppose the rest of the family are, are that. I, but I don't really talk to them about more. Yeah, I mean, I would say professionally, uh, friends would be more, you know, here I would lean on, be support, you know, support work. And that's, and, you know, different, uh, and, and different, and different friends for different elements of it. Um, I would be, I mean, my best friend's Eddie Doherty, and he's a master goldsmith, you know, he's one of Ireland's best jewellers. And, um, but well, we just have chats and coffee and talk nonsense and stuff. And we talk work and practical things and he helps me with jewelry stuff and the more technical things he's way more technical than i am if i want to talk about 
um, concepts and, and pushing the work out there and stuff. You know, Gail Mahams, you know, we have brilliant chats. Gail keeps me keeps me going, keep, keeps me motivated. And, um, you know, because she's always talking about the work she's going to do. And that makes me think, Jesus, I've got to get my, you know, my ass in gear. <laughs> Because she's doing all this cool stuff, I really should be doing more cool stuff. So, um, so yeah, um, you know, Gail and Heather and, and and you know, I've got painter friends and and stuff that would talk to me, and they give you a different perspective. I have a friend who's a painter and photographer, and uh, Tim Millen, and uh, he's brilliant at both, secondly, and um, but he and he he has a completely different view of what I do, um, different perspective on it. And it's always great. And, and he does different things. So he's able to, you know, we have different to conversations and he's very fine art, very, you know, thinks along those lines. So it gives you a different um, input. And I think that's it, it, it's really important to have that circle, whether it's your family or or not. Generally, I, if my advice would be don't listen to your family, unless they're creative, <laughs> don't listen to your family. And even if they it's are, they might not get you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't, but don't, oh, your family, I mean, my sister, when I started doing art, my sister's advice to me was, you know, you could, you, you should be an accountant and do art at the weekend. You know, that'd be really good. That's what you should do. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. and this is, she also came out with a brilliant one of, I should say, the work for a five. So, um, generally, <laughs> what I do with my family's advice is, is listen to it and then do the exact opposite. And it's, I've been quite successful doing that. Um, <laughs> Uh, or, or usually listen to my family's advice and then go and talk to my my friends to recover from the trauma of <laughs> of, <laughs> of my family's opinions. So yeah, I mean, I would lean on your friends who are fellow professionals in different you know in different fields and stuff. You know, and it, it's good to have you know good to have people outside your your sphere. You know, not just like you know silversmiths and jewelers like you know talk to painters and ceramicists and textile artists and stuff they all have a different view of things and they can all be very insightful and just nudge you in little directions or just keep your spirits up you know yeah um you you know you'll know that you have connections on a certain level i mean i would say yeah eddie's my best mate gail's my art bestie really and you know heather's pretty support as well along with gail so yeah i have right. different little crew you know yeah, that support network, which is great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, they have always nudged me and encouraged me to keep me going the whole way through this, you know, um, help me push on and, and apply for things that, like, I wouldn't have done the portfolio thing if Gail hadn't given me a shove. Eddie's encouraged me with work um, all the time. Gail and Heather, both Tim, you know, and some of them, you know, Tim's photograph me for, for publications and stuff when I needed an, a good image of myself and he's like yeah i'll do that for you and he's a fantastic photographer so yeah i mean you need you absolutely need that you don't do it on your own i mean you might i might work on my own level on my own but i'm i'm not doing it on my own mm-hmm. um i've definitely got um i've got my friends supporting me you yeah. know so you really need that mm-hmm. you know you mentioned before as well was it your grandfather he was a riveter i, I just kind of you, yeah, I, I quite like that nice balance that, you know, you were hammering in a way and, you know, he had this history and he was hammering. Is, is that, yeah. do you think that has influenced you in any way? Um, my grandfather was, yeah, I mean, he, he worked, uh, he worked in Harlem and Wolfie. He, he had to travel around to different shipyards in the UK to get work when my, my dad was growing up. And um, so he was working class, works with his hands had a garage full of bits that he would fit her with when he retired, loved, you know, doing garden and stuff. So we had, we had that sort of, and I, I don't know, there was that sort of connection, I suppose. He wasn't an artist or creative or anything like that, but I mean, a very working class man. I don't know what he, I mean, he didn't, by the time I started doing art, he was, again, you know, dementia, did, you know, really, had kicked in and he, he passed away um at the end of first my first year of my degree so he didn't really see or was aware of that so we didn't have we didn't have never had conversations and stuff but i mean i have a couple of his hammers in my workshop which i use just the small ones um i think one of them is just his workshop hammer and there's another one which is like a little riveting hammer which i've heard two stories about one one story was my uncle made it in metal workshop in school uh, and brought it back 
And then the other one was that this was a wee testing hammer. They used to have a small hammer that they go around the ships and they would tap the rivet to get to sound it. And it would make a certain sound if it was if it was a if it was a good join, a good rivet, and it would make a bad sound if it was, so they would know they would know if the rivet was good or, or bad and whether they'd have to do it again. I mean and my granddad towards the end was he would have been like a senior riveter or you know, he would have run a group. So um he probably would have done that. So I don't know I think it probably was my my uncle's thing that he made uh, in class, but but he told me the story of the rivet, of them testing the rivet, so um, and said, "Oh no, I don't think I made that." So I don't, you, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I like the idea of that, you know, the testing of the rivets. But I think it's an interesting connection that we both we both were good with our hands, and, and we both work metal in different, you know in different very different ways you know he was building ships and i'm building tiny little things so <laughs> but it's quite cool it's a cool connection well i feel like we could talk to you all day but don't want to keep you much further could you tell us what you what kind of music you listen to to unwind well I, i've been listening to uh erlen cooper a lot recently so he's done he's just done a trilogy of albums um based on his home um, of Orkney so mm-hmm. they're really atmospheric instrumental uh, and they have sections of people telling stories about the sea or reading poems about the sea so it's um it's kind of apt and atmospheric for that and uh, and very relaxing as well but I have been listening to an awful lot of um, old school metal as well so <laughs> <laughs> uh, not some well yeah to unwind sometimes it's good to get your blood up you know so um, yeah do you think that, that helps you with the, with the hammering then? That yeah, the it definitely rhythm, does. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you've got a lot of work to get through, it's the heavy tunes go on and you get you get busy. So, um, <laughs> yeah, those sorts of things. So, yeah, it's obviously different music for different moods. Sometimes it's chilled out stuff, and like Mogwai and things like that. And um, Catherine Joseph would be another one I really love. Um, I usually have sex music going on as well, you know, so it's kind of nice to have a conversation in the background and music so you're listening to all sorts of stuff but sometimes i need to focus i'll put on something specific whether it's an upbeat up tempo thing um or whether it's something a bit more chilled out um so yeah that's what i'm sort of listening to final question what was the last piece of craft that you bought uh the last piece of craft i bought i bought just before lockdown i got a a large cup from um, a Scottish pot- potter, Juliet McLeod. Uh, it's really, it's um, it's it's really beautiful. It's got these, she does all these kind of landscapey marks and stuff. It's almost like it's a little bit like some paintings I do, but she's got her own thing going on. It's beautiful. Um, mm. Although I use it as a plant pot because it's so big. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I just went. I actually, I would be afraid of picking this up. So I have that, and then I also received. Um, I got a Jack Doherty mug because I stayed with them last year in um, in uh, Cornwall wow. in Mousel. Um Yeah, Jack and Sarah put me up. Um, Sarah was curating uh, the show I was in, and um, they're really lovely. And then um, they give me a mug, let me pick one from this big <laughs> rack, and I was just like, oh, and uh, which I loved. And I had my morning cup, co- my special morning coffee in it, and then I came back just before lockdown happened and um one of my cats had knocked it off the counter and it was smashed on the floor so i had to oh. sort of mess them going uh, can i buy a replacement so um <laughs> bless her wee hearts they sent me they sent me one just they just sent me one um uh, so that's, I, I, that's my other my other um acquisition which is yeah. um which is a real favorite so yeah juliet's works but yeah, i'd love to get more work from her and yeah. And Jack Doherty's works just uh, phenomenal. I mean, Brilliant. he does, and he uh, does two ranges. This was this is his kind of homeware range, yeah. which was just lovely, um, wow. as well as the porcelain vessel. So yeah, there's two people. So look them up. Yeah. Brilliant, lovely. So if people want to get in touch with you or want to find out more information, where should they go? Well, you can find me on Instagram, Stu Cairns Maker. I have a website, which I occasionally have to hit, www.stuartcairns.com. And if you say it, put info in front of stuartcairns.com, you can email me as well. So um, 
and if I have time, I'll call you me back. I'm, I can be atrocious at emailing people back, but it all depends on time and stuff. But um, but yeah, those would be my main things. And the illustrations are upwards and over. So if you look me up on those as well, and that's on Instagram and has its own website as well. Well, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. This has been great. Well. Yeah, it's been really lovely. And it's been really quite reassuring to be able to do it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, we will eternally owe you cake for having to put you through this twice. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I'll hold you to that, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. So you did press record this time, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Stuart, for a wonderful insight into your practice. Thank you also to the Arts Council of Northern Ireland, who have kindly supported our second series with their Artist Emergency Programme. For our next episode, we are making conversations with Deborah Toner, whose episode we can't wait to share on Thursday, the 16th of July, 2020.